Uh, so anyway, good afternoon. Uh, I am Melinda Mattson. I am with the U.S. Economic Development Administration, and I want to welcome you to our Business Resources for Economic Developers webinar series. And this series is brought to you by USAVA, <clears throat> excuse me, USDA Rural Development and GoBiz. And this series is designed to increase the capacity and knowledge. If you can mute your mics, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, sorry about that. Of our economic developers and chambers of commerce so they can better assist their businesses and help them recover from natural disasters such as storms, as the storms we experienced this last winter, and become more resilient, grow, and prosper. So this afternoon, webinar is on access to capital. And uh, first, we're going to hear from uh, two of our best direct lenders uh, in the state and how they leverage resources from a wide variety of federal and state sources to meet the businesses in the to meet the needs of the businesses in the communities they serve. And this is going to be followed by a panel discussion, not a, this panel discussion will be followed by short presentations from representatives from SBA, USDA Rural Development, and EDA. First, a few uh, housekeeping items. Unless you're a speaker, if you could please keep your camera off and your microphone muted, would greatly appreciate it. Uh, otherwise, you're going to look like a speaker. Um, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and we will try and get to it today or our speakers will respond um, as soon as they can after the webinar. Okay. okay. Also, we are recording this webinar and it will be posted within a week or so on EDA's YouTube channel. I'll send out the link to everyone that was registered um, as soon as I get it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, not a good blog tasker here. Uh, so to begin with, we have two powerhouse women who happen to have similar names. Uh, Debbie Morimoto of California Capital Finance Development Corporation in Sacramento. They also have very long names of their organizations. And Deb Raven of Valley Small Business Development Corporation in Fresno. Uh, you can find a uh, longer uh, bio of them on the website that we set up for this. Uh, but we're going to get started. And if we could go to the next slide, I would, and we're going to begin with Debbie. Okay, I guess I'm in. It was the other one. <laughs> Uh, she's fine. Okay, not sure who has a hot mic. Uh, but Debbie, um, Cameron, can we go to the next slide? There we go. Debbie, I'll turn it over to you. And the question that you are answering to begin with is, can you briefly describe the services your organization provides and your service area? So thank you. Take it away. Debbie, you're muted. Thank you, Melinda. Um, first of all, I want to thank Melinda and EDA for hosting this webinar and allowing us the opportunity to share the resources that each of our organizations has um, and our ability to share what we do in addition to what we do as an EDA RLF. So California Capital Small Business Financial Development Corporation has been chartered since 1982. We are a CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, and we are a financial development corporation. Those uh, are two of our main uh, designations. Um, as a CDFI, 51 plus percent of our assets are, um, are invested into programs and services that benefit low and moderate income communities. And as a financial development corporation and FDC, we administer the state of California's small business loan guarantee program. 
um, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary, which of which we are very proud. Um, and I'm even more proud that I've been here for 35 years. Next slide. <laughs> so what we do, um, you know, I, I like to I like to structure my presentations in terms of who we are and what we do. And over the years, California Capital has had um, the honor of being designated and awarded a number of different programs. We are an SBA Women's Business Center. And under our Women's Business Center, we have our Women's Business Center License to Care program, which is a daycare training program. We are the Sacramento Valley Small Business Development Center and SBDC. Um, and we host our Sacramento Valley SBDC uh, Capital Summits. And we also host the Inclusivity Project, which is a state, um, which is a regional program that is specific to African-American owned businesses. And all of our programs um, under the Women's Business Center and the our SBDC, we also host our business success forums that we've done in 11 languages. And we've actually done it from here to Fresno. Um, and so we're really proud of the fact that we are able to assist small businesses who are an, who have limited or have are no English speaking skills. Um, and I have to say that one of our initial um, one of our initial grants and support from EDA allowed us to purchase um, translation headsets so that when we have our bilingual forums, we have the ability to have a translator off to the side so that we can make sure that those who need the translation have the ability to have it uh, to, to access it. Um, in addition to the SBDC and the Women's Business Center, we are an APEX accelerator. And for those of you who are more familiar with the term PTAC, Procurement Technical Assistance Center, our APEX accelerator has been rebranded um, from the PTAC. And uh, the APEX, our APEX accelerator works with small businesses who are now in um, the position where they want to become a government contractor. So we walk them through uh, different uh, certifications. There's SAM registrations. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. And um, we have them in a bid match system so that we can match them with potential bid oper um, contract opportunities. We are also uh, a business information center for Sacramento County. Um, which is similar to what we do within the Women's Business Center. And if you were to ask me the distinction be between the Women's Business Center and the SBDC, I would say the Women's Business Center is more startup phase businesses, those who have an idea, those who are just getting started, whereas the SBDC, it works more with advanced businesses. We have specific um, advisors that work on marketing skills or loan readiness, um, succession planning. So there's a little bit more specificity in terms of what our SBDC uh, provides. All of those programs, and I wanna make sure I make this clear, all of our programs are intertwined with each other. We like to call it our continuum of services. So at any point in the life cycle of a business, once they go through our intake process and we determine where we need to refer them to, they may go to the Women's Business Center. Once they advance a bit, we may then refer them over to the um, SBDC. And if they're um, interested in government contracting, they will refer them over to our APEX Accelerator. All of these programs then feed into the pipeline for our lending programs. So just recently, we became an SBA micro, micro enterprise loan program intermediary. Those are loans of up to $50,000. We have CDFI funds. Of course, we have our EDA, EDA revolving loan funds under the disaster and the CARES. And we also um, are the administrator of the uh, California State Small Business Loan Guarantee Program. So, like I said, at any point in time in the life cycle of a business, we like to think that we have a, a program that will fit the needs of that business. But we also want to recognize that we are not the end all and be all. 
that there are a number of resources out there within our state and within the nation, the country. And if there's something that we are unable to address, we have other resource partners that we can refer to. Like for ag lending, we'll re refer them over to Debbie at Valley. So um, that those are the programs that we have. In, in response to our service areas, it depends on the program. Our state loan guarantee program, we have statewide authority to lend. Our CDFI lending, as long as the business is in a qualified investment area, we're able to lend. Um, and the other programs, the Women's Business Center, the uh, SBA microloan program, and the Small Business Development Center, they all have their own footprints as well as our Apex Accelerator. Next slide. So all of those programs of which you are very proud, um, and I have to tell you, during the pandemic, the, the demand came so uh, became so intensive that we experienced a tremendous amount of growth. At the beginning of the pandemic, we had a staff of 13. We are now a staff of 33. And it is those 32 people, not including myself, because they're the ones who do the work, um, resulted in the impacts that you see on the screen. So we're really, really happy that we were able to um, help small business getting the counseling and advising they needed and still able to host training events via webinar. We are just in the process now of doing in-person again. We helped 104 businesses get started, 12,000 jobs supported. There was um, a huge number in increased sales. $34 million in loans and equity investments, and $194 million in government contracts through our Apex Accelerator. So we're very proud of our accomplishments, but this is not done by ourselves. This is also done um, in collaboration with a lot of our partners. And so we thank our partners for that too. So thanks, Melinda. Oh, thank you, Debbie. So Dan, over to you and uh, your uh, area is a little different, centered in Fresno. So why don't you tell us about your programs and what you do? Can you hear me okay? Okay, great, finally. So first of all, I should have gone first because it's hard to follow such a rock star like Debbie. So she and her organization do an amazing job up in Sacramento. And um, I'm like Debbie, I've been here for 33 years. So she's been my idol for a long time. So uh, anyway, uh, powerful women today speaking out. So um, the first slide, basically, um, it's replicated from what Cal Capital has done. We started the same year. We're celebrating the same 40th anniversary. We're all CDFIs and FDCs, and um, we provide a lot of the same programs. Um, obviously, through as an FDC, we are administrator for the State Loan Guarantee Program. And so uh, we all go statewide, um, but still there's so much business to do in the state of California. There's really no overlapping. We respect everyone's service area. Um, so if some, I get a call from somebody from Sacramento, I'm going to refer them to Deb or Debbie, and she's also going to do the same thing for me in Fresno. But that's never been a problem between our organizations. We work closely together um, with all the FDCs in the state of California. Um, we, like Debbie, do technical assistance, but certainly not to the level, not as robustly as she and her organization. Um, they do a tremendous job, and it takes tremendous staffing. She's got, I think, 35 employees. I have seven. So we do a different type of business assistance. Uh, we're probably more uh, focused on our direct lending. We have developed a sustainable model for our organization that uh, through our direct loans, we're able to fund our own organization and not work off and depend upon grants. Um, that probably has to do with my business background because I'm a small business owner myself. I borrow money every year to finance our crops and our operations. I have to set across the desk from a banker. I have to prepare financial statements and cash flows and budget projections and business plans. So I do that on my own. And so, therefore, we have uh, really focused on trying to assist people um, sustain their dreams, 
develop their dreams and maintain those dreams. So um, there's certainly a lot of people, especially in our area, uh, people forget about the central San Joaquin Valley uh, as far as um, economic development. It's hard to, for harder for us to get the grants and um, the attention that some of the metropolitan cities are able to get, basically LA and San Francisco. So, but we we have our own um, distinct district. We finance all farmers from uh, and businesses from Modesto to Kern County. We have the ability to do that. However, our direct loans. I tend to focus uh, basically in the Fresno, Kings, Tulare, uh, Madera County area on small businesses. So again, a small staff, we need to be able to maintain our service area. So it's just a matter of what we can sustain. Um, also, we are a micro loan lender. We previously were a micro loan lender with SBA. Um, we were able to finance the Mong strawberry growers and there when they came to Fresno and we were able to get them to be established. Um, that was our first direct lending program other than farm. I came in 1990 and started the, the direct lending programs there. Um, after SBA microloans, we went into USDA where we have we, a relationship with them uh, offering their IRP programs and RMAP programs assisting rural communities of a population 50,000 or less. And again, that is a underserved market, anything in the rural communities because of not having access to capital, technology, money, and a variety of other services. So um, we've had a real need and that's been a good program for us. Um, and, it, and the ability to finance the farming operations has been sustained through the iBank um, that allows us to leverage the trust fund to provide financing for farmers. It's similar to SBA. We obtain a guarantee through Farm Service Agency, which is similar to SBA 7A loan guarantee. Those are resold and then replenish um, the trust funds so that we can continue to leverage the monies available to us. So that's grown and we'll go over that slide later on. Um, and you can actually go to the next slide, by the way, I'm rambling on. Um, we um, also then, because of the lack of capital, we expanded into the Farmer MAP program as well. And um, that's private capital that basically we're a servicing agent for them. We do the underwriting and servicing. They provide the funding and they take the risk. Um, but it's been a great program because we've had unlimited capital under that program. And so um, again, just with all of the CDFIs, not just Cal Capital and ourselves, our only limitation is our access to capital ourselves. Our, our, we're limited by our funding sources. So we're always looking for new programs, new funding sources, such as EDA or CDFI. Our uh, private capital, we, we've both obtained lending relationships with private institutions such as Wells Fargo, our Robo Bank, now Mechanics Bank. Um, so again, we're always looking for partners so that we can partner with the investors and then we can turn around, pass that capital on to small business borrowers or farming borrowers. Next slide. Just not to, um, Debbie has an amazing wealth of information and statistics. Um, I just put some things down here that were interesting to me. Again, from a lending perspective on our farm loans, it doesn't sound like much from a commercial standpoint uh, when you're dealing with people like Farm Credit and um, the other big banks as far as their financing. But for us, it's a lot. We basically, I actually find, uh, funded two loans this morning, totaling 2 million. So we're up to 40 million now and 301 farm loans. And uh, what I'm proudest of is over the period of time since 1990 until now, we've only had two losses of about $160,000. Considering the type of lending we do, that's more than amazing because we are financing the farm operations that the farm credits of the world or the commercial lenders don't want. They don't think that they're either viable or well collateralized or worth the risk. And so the fact that we've been able to do that without any losses, to, uh, it's a credit to our staff, our board, and our program. So, um, you know, we're very, very proud of that. As I stated, we've also uh, funded about 17 million under Farmer Mac as well. That's helped our um, ability to provide capital access. 
on small business. Uh, we've guaranteed over 300 loan guarantees in the last, uh, since 2007, so about 15 years for about $150 million. And we've also funded about 551 small business loans to, um, right at about 47 million. Again, our loss rate is low um, because I am a small business owner myself. We make sure that our uh, small business applicants and our farm applicants are well prepared, that they've looked over what their projections for the year, they are well collateralized as well as they can be. Some people don't have collateral, but they understand their business model and they also have multiple plans. Uh, it's not just plan A, what you're going to do with the business, it's what happens. You need a plan B, C, D, E, F, and G. So again, there's a lot of counseling goes into that, both, both pre- Closing and post-closing, as Debbie knows about. Um, so I credit, again, our staffing for that very low loss rate on those types of credit. Um, we've been able, currently our staff is only four lenders, including me. But again, you can see we have wisdom. We have 170 years of lending experience with those four people. Um, so uh, we've seen a lot of changes over the year, but um, Basically, a small business is the same. You have to show the ability to pay back the loan, whatever you're going to borrow, no matter what it is, small business, agriculture, manufacturing, you've got to be able to show the ability to pay back. Um, the other thing that I'm most proud of, it's taken me 15 years to clean up our portfolio from the recession back in 2008 through 2011. But we currently have no delinquencies, no past dues, and no defaults. So we're very, very proud of that. That doesn't mean that we haven't taken risk. We take risk on every loan that we do. But we try to mitigate that risk with our loan guarantee program or the ability to get a guarantee through Farm Service Agency, SBA, or USDA. And um, I, the other thing that I'm proud of is that we received a national award uh, about our technical assistance model that we uh, bought a van and we take it to the communities, the rural communities and take our office to them because uh, a lot of people don't have the capacity to drive to North Fresno to turn in a loan application. They don't have the technology to scan it in digitally. So we try to take our services to them. So we're very proud of that and we received a national award for that. And that's about all I have. Well, thank you. And uh, I think the audience can see why you two were chosen. We have a lot of great direct lenders in this state, um, but wanted to make sure that we highlighted uh, both an urban Sacramento lender and a rural lender in this uh, webinar. So the next question, I'm gonna start with Debbie again first, um, and that's done to keep me straight. <laughs> Um, not all lenders are called Deb or Debbie. I do want to point out. <laughs> um, so, uh, and both of you have mentioned this a little bit, uh, but I will start with Debbie because you have different perspectives here. And we all want our small businesses to succeed. But when a business comes to you, how do you evaluate their creditworthiness and readiness for lending? And what do you do if they're not ready yet? So Debbie, we'll turn it to you. So I have the luxury of having an amazing team of very, very committed individuals to work with. And the type of lending that Deb and I do are for businesses and, and farmers that can't get credit elsewhere. They can't walk into a bank and apply for a loan and expect to even have that application considered. So we we oftentimes refer to ourselves as intermediary lenders. And I like to think of ourselves as kind of being that springboard. But in terms of how we evaluate the creditworthiness and the readiness, we have the luxury of having a Women's Business Center and an SBDC. And we have the counselors in-house that can evaluate along with our lending team. We have a director of lending, a business development officer, an underwriter, a portfolio manager, and a closing coordinator. And our, our underwriter and our um, 
business development officer and our director of lending, they they look at each credit individually. It, this is not a cookie cutter approach. There's no way you can do the type of lending that we do with the check the box and it, and it qualifies. But if we find that they're weak in a certain area, we'll send them over to our women's business or our SBDC for what we call our loan readiness um, counseling and advising to to let them know what it is that they need to even be ready to submit an application. And we'll work with them on the front end to make sure make sure that happens. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is once we get them to that that stage and once perhaps they've um, taken advantage of the webinars that we have online in terms of loan readiness and what is needed, um, you know, we really have to get to know the borrower. And um, we, California Capital is part of a small business coalition for racial equity. And we have uh, developed a underwriting criteria under a racial equity lens. So we have to be mindful of the different types of lenders, what their situations are. And my team takes all of that cons into consideration when determining how they evaluate that loan. And the reality is, and I, I say this all the time is, is sometimes it could be a small fifteen or twenty-five thousand dollar loan, and you know that the borrower has a commitment and the skin in the game to do this. And sometimes it comes down to the character of the borrower. So I'll stop there, Melinda, because it's not always easy to say you're credit worthy or you're credit ready, but because of the type of lending we do, we're willing to take that risk. That's why that's why we exist, because we can consider those riskier loans. Thank you. Uh, interesting perspective. Deb, um, how do you work with your clients to get them loan ready? So um, we're similar, exactly what Deb does. It's the same practice um, we're a lot a little bit different in the fact of our approach we don't have the um, luxury of having an SBDC or women's business center in our back pocket in the the hallway down the, the way but what I do have is that half of my staff are small business owners ourselves and so again we've got the business sense instilled in our staff and the ones that aren't small business owners they're here to serve and everybody wants to make loans and, and get access to capital. So um, we're probably stricter than a SBDC in all honesty, because we know the downfalls and the pitfalls that you're gonna face as a business owner. Um, so um, they call me Debbie Downer sometimes, what can I say? But I, I'm also the person that's gonna go out on a limb and try and, and make the deal happen. So, um, but briefly, I'm not sure if all the audience is well-versed in Lending 101, but we always fall back to the five C's of credit. Um, and so as we're counseling borrowers, they have to be able to sufficiently answer the questions surrounding those five C's of credit in order to get a loan. Because if they're weak on one of them or two of them, maybe it can be mitigated by a state loan guarantee or risk mitigant, maybe not. Uh, but briefly, those the first one's capacity that's usually everybody's favorite because that's the ability to cash flow or the ability to pay back the loan. With the state loan guarantee program, we have a lot of flexibility, but the one thing that they require is that it's got to be able to show the ability to pay back the loan. Any lender wants to know how they're going to be repaid. Any funder wants to know how the CDFI is going to pay back the loan. So it's just common sense from the get-go that you have to show how you're gonna be able to pay back the loan. Um, capital is another thing, and Debbie mentioned it. No, you have to have skin in the game. If there's no skin in the game, the answer is going to be no to any applicant because there's just not grant funding available for startup businesses. In olden days, it used to be there, but it's just not there. So all lenders are going to require 
some type of skin in the game, whether it's cash investment, um, cash already invested as far as your R&D and you paid for leases or you bought your startup equipment and you need operating capital for a working for working capital for a line of credit. Uh, you have real estate, you have equity in your home, you have paid off vehicles. There's got to be something that you're willing to bring to the table in order for the lender to consider your request. That breeds right into collateral. Um, again, all commercial lenders are looking for 100% collateralized loans. They want to have a dollar for um, of secondary support for your loan for every dollar they're lending. And that's in accounts receivables, your crops, if you're going to grow crops, it's in your inventory, it is your equipment, it is your real estate, your building, your brick and mortar. So there, that's what commercial lenders want is a one-to-one -one coverage. And they want usually a, a almost, a, let's say a 1.5 uh, debt coverage ratio on uh, overall debt servicing requirement. That So that eliminates a lot of people right there when you go get a loan because it just on a startup loan you're never going to have that then we bounce over to conditions what are the conditions existing in the marketplace right now if you're going to go start a restaurant in 2020 during the middle of covid when we were all under lockdown it would be uh, very odd if a bank approved that loan because there were conditions existing in the market that probably would limit your ability to grow and the ability to pay back the loan. If you're trying to buy a truck and haul products up and down the freeway and you're buying an old diesel truck that's going to be illegal to use in two years, you're not going to find somebody to be able to finance that because, again, it's not going to pass the air quality control board. So there's, there's always extenuating circumstances that the small business borrower has to consider before a lender will fund the loan. And finally, which Debbie alluded to, character, which is my most important C. I always, we always meet the borrower. We always plan a site visit. We learn to know that borrower because we want to understand that that borrower knows that he's borrowing, he or she is borrowing money and that they owe the money and that they it is their plan to pay it back. We understand that there is adversity. We understand there's hard times or they have COVID or we have epidemics or reasons that people can't pay back loans, but at least they'll try. It's in their character to try and pay back the loan, to try and pay back their debts. Obviously, we all work with them on restructures. So to me, integrity is of utmost importance. And sometimes the borrower is just not ready when um, even they go through an SBDC or a startup course or take webinars and they may have a co-maker that really wants them to do this loan, but they're not, they haven't done their research. They don't understand the markets. They don't understand the commitment tied to operating a small business, especially a restaurant or an agricultural operation. So at that point in time, we do a lot more counseling uh, to take out the risk for them. Because if we say yes to a business that is not ready, they're going to fail. And then they're going to come back to us and say, why didn't you tell me this? Or why did you loan me the money? You shouldn't have uh, said yes, because then they've risked their house, their their cars, they've had to file bankruptcy. And they they have the risk of losing everything because it wasn't a well thought out plan and because possibly a lender financed it without doing their due diligence. So we have a moral responsibility to the small business borrowers to make sure they've done their homework and that they have every chance of success in their plan. And finally, my favorite word is no does not mean no, because in our world, if you get a no from a commercial lender, that doesn't mean that you're not financeable and you're not viable. It just means that you don't fit in that bank's box. And so you need to find another lender, maybe with the help of our state loan guarantee or another CDFI that will look at your loan package and your projections and your business plan favorably, and that will help you out. And so um, there's very few deals we can't do. Those deals are the ones that are not viable 
are there there are, are there too premature to be successful so we really all of us all of our cdfis we're in here because we love helping people and trying to get them to have access to capital so we're going to go um, out on the limb to try and help these people achieve their success thank you yeah. oh so we have a question in the chat that i think will be pretty quick um and it's do you have any data on what percentage of applicants for microloans progress towards underwriting progress towards the underwriting process maybe i don't understand that very well um It might be a question for Deb with the SBDC. Um, I can answer, we get a lot of calls. We answer all of our phone calls. We will work with the client to submit a full package that will work with the SBDCs or a score counselor. It's probably about a at least a 50% fall off rate, maybe even 70% that we won't get a completed package back. So it's not that it doesn't get to underwriting, it doesn't get back to us in a completed fashion that we can make a decision. Debbie, do you have any thoughts on that? You're absolutely right, Deb. We, we find that my team says, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And they, they, want, they need the capital, they want the capital, but when they start the process, a lot of times they expect you to do it for them, but you can't do it for them. They learn nothing if you do it for them. But we're here on the pre-loan TA side to help them through that process. We can help get them help with putting their financials together, their cash flow projections, their business plan. But it's 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 up to them to actually do the work. So um, in terms of making sure it gets to the underwriting process um it's it's a joint effort between the borrower and us the lender to make sure that they have all their ducks in a row so that we can put them into our um, application system to go to underwriting and i'm not sure if i answered the question correctly but um just just um, expanding on what Deb said. So I, I think we can follow up on that one and make sure that it's answered. Uh, but very quickly, because um, my friend Kathy from Calaveras County, do either of you serve with any of your programs, Calaveras County? Yes, <laughs> we both do. Okay, <laughs> there you go, Kathy. Uh, uh, feel free to reach out to both of them. Uh, I can make sure you have their contact information. Um, but uh, they'll take care of you somehow. Uh, I know Kathy's got a lot of needs over there in that county. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out is that we, uh, we, and we'll share it later in this, but we do have a lot of uh, other direct lenders in the state. Um, uh, so we're going to put out the list of them uh, so that uh, everyone can find one that's closest to them. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead on the questions, ladies. Um, so, um, so Debbie, um, for our economic development partners out there, are there any business loan options that you would not recommend small businesses take or that could do more harm than good? So I have two answers for that. We always tell them to stay away from online lenders, predatory lenders, hard money lenders, Try to stay away from factoring companies if you can. And of late, I've been no, I've I've been hearing a lot that, well, they they went and got an online loan because they didn't know we existed. So once they find us, then they know that there is more reasonable capital available to them. Um, and you know. That said, we have we have done a few loans, and we just are we're just getting ready to do one right now, where the gentleman got 
a um, online loan at 38% interest. We were able to sit down with him, tell him what he needed in terms of the information he needs to get to us. And it's that same story of you can you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. This gentleman drank the water like crazy because within within a day he had everything to us because the mm-hmm. amount of money he saved in monthly payments on that loan from a 38% loan to an EDA loan, revolving loan fund loan, is made a vast difference and it will make a vast difference in his cash flow and his business success. So stay stay away from those. And, you know, oftentimes too, we'll get a borrower in our door and we'll go through all of the paces with them, get them through the process. And in the end, it doesn't cash flow or maybe the projections are way too too, um, aggressive to be realistic. And sometimes we have to look inside ourselves too to say, are we really helping this business owner by giving them a loan, by approving a loan to allow them to take on debt? We need to be very truthful with them and say, we need to help you a little bit more <laughs> to get to this place before we can reconsider your loan. So, you know, in terms of who we wouldn't, who we wouldn't, I've, I've explained that and why, and what some of the remedy is for some of those loans, they can come to a direct lender like Deb or I, and perhaps take out that that high interest rate loan uh, and save their business, basically. And even from our standpoint, we have to look inside of ourselves as to whether or not we're doing them a favor by giving them a loan. And we've 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 come to this point post COVID, and and this has to do with the answer and and kind of not. But you know, I think small businesses have become so accustomed to low interest, no interest, forgivable loans and grants that they're they're continuing to expect that. But slowly, I think they're finding lenders like Deb and I to be able to help them over that hump post-COVID with an EDA loan or a CDFI loan or a direct loan or SBA micro loan. Thank you, Debbie. And Deb, I want to give you an opportunity because you're one of the few um, that I know of, of ag lenders in the state. And certainly after the winter that we've had, uh, there's there's a big need for ag lending out there in places that, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a big issue. So can you explain to us kind of how you do that and, and what it is? It's, uh, I'd like to learn more. Thank you. So we'll keep it brief. I'm not sure how many people are interested in agriculture. Obviously, we'll all eat, so we should be, right? But um, uh, agriculture lending is a niche lending. It's uh, You have to really understand agriculture and um, the validity uh, or the volatility of agriculture. Every time we start a crop year, we're risking everything that we've earned our entire lives. It's on the line. And uh, as you all saw what happened this year with all the flooding and the rain and then more flooding in, we still have 120,000 acres underwater out at the Thule Lake. So that was farm ground. We've had low commodity prices. The price of almonds, walnuts is uh, what it was 40 years ago. Uh, while our cost inputs are high, uh, gas is high, labor is high. So there's a real bloodbath happening this year. So we plan to be very busy on restructuring and reevaluating. Some people will not be able to stay in business because it just doesn't pencil out. It does not cash flow to farm in California right at the moment with these prices. Now, having said that, there's some crops that are good. Tree fruit's really good right now. Dairy's awful. So um, we just have having done this for almost 40 years we know the cycles but i can honestly say we've never seen a year like this year coupled with high interest rates so it's just a perfect storm for a a complete bloodbath um in those years we shine because again uh, a lot of the commercial banks are the farm credit systems 
Um, a lot of their loan officers haven't been through hard times like this. And so if a borrower doesn't fit into their box, they'll try to work with them the best they can, but they have uh, pretty strict parameters as far as loan to value or debt coverage ratio, uh, liquidity ratios. If they don't fit in those boxes, they can't help them. But the good news, at least in the Central Valley, is that they refer everything to us. And we can help them either through the state loan guarantee program or through Farm Service Agency refinancing with loan guarantees. So we've done that uh, historically in recessions, to farm depressions, that those are our best years because we're able to help so many people. Um, our limit is lack of capital uh, because we can only loan so much and we can only do small dollars. Uh, under FSA loan guarantees, we can go up to $2 million. But as you would expect, most farm operations of any size, their operating capital are begin at two to $5 million. So I really can't help them under our existing programs. That's why we went into Farmer Mac. We can go up to 20 million under Farmer Mac. Uh, so there's a potential for us to expand and help more people. Um, what we have is the opportunity to help many farm operations at various cycles. We do a really good job on the beginning farmer loan program where uh, someone that hasn't bought their first farm can get into it with a 10% down, kind of like a first time home buyer program, but it's with through uh, with farm service agencies. So we finance 50% portion of it with a, a guarantee from the state, uh, from farm service agency. And then 40% comes from FSA. So the borrower only has to come in with 10%. With a conventional lender or with farm credit, they want you to have 40%. So that's a lot of money because you're talking a, a minimum farm purchase is about $500,000. So that's $200,000 they don't have to come up with. They only have to come up with 50. So it allows people to get into a farm operation fairly easily. Um, then we provide operational financing as well as uh, equipment financing either with an FSA guarantee or through the state loan guarantee program. So um, if they're not quite ready to go to farm credit or not quite ready to go to commercial or community-based lender, then we can finance them. Uh, with the state loan guarantee, we can go through seven years. FSA has no cap. So we've had borrowers that have been here for 20 years. They love it because we run them the way the banks used to be 40 years ago. So everybody likes our customer service. So that even though they can go conventionally, they don't. And then finally, if we, let's say for capacity reasons, we don't have enough money to be able to finance people, then we would move them to a commercial lender and offer a state loan guarantee program. Uh, obviously the commercial banks have a lot more capital than us. And so that's a way to mitigate their risk. It allows the borrower the chance to get 100% financing of what their operational needs are uh, and uh, reducing the, the the risk to the bank. We lose the customer, but we've helped them grow from beginning to sustainable and then finally to a commercial, um, a, a status of a commercial loan. Um, that's about it. We've talked about the numbers already. And again, we can basically help a farm operation from cradle to grave. We're in for the long haul. And we do all crops, all crops. We've done dairy, livestock. We're not too big. Uh, big enough as far as capital to be able to finance a large dairy operation. We have them, done them in the 80s and 90s, but right now the farm uh, dairy operations take a tremendous amount of capital. So that's where we'd move them to a commercial bank and offer a state loan guarantee. Uh, we've done equipment, hay harvesting equipment, solar units, anything uh, to do with the farm. So uh, again, through IRP, we can do the rural community. So anything agriculture, we're it. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions from the chat because uh, we are, and we're going to run out of time here in a few minutes. But one thing I thought was really interesting in the chat, these other questions I'm going to uh, let you answer offline. They seem a little more complicated than we have time for. But when it comes to consolidation loans uh, for small businesses, uh, is that up to the lender? Can any CDFI do that? Uh, what I, I guess that's also talking about uh, refinancing of loans. Um, is is uh, do you have any thoughts on on that um, for small businesses? 
Debbie, well, you want to go first? Well, I know for us, I'd mentioned the, the situation earlier about taking out um, a high interest rate um, online loan. And I know on the state guarantee program, and Deb, you've probably done the same, is you've taken out some existing debt or consolidated debt so that the cash flow becomes a little bit more a little bit more healthy if they can consolidate the debt. So, so Debbie brought up the point about the state loan guarantee program. There's certain eligibility issues we have to deal with. So right. a lot of people go out and start a business on credit cards, but uh, under most government programs, especially with the FSA and with the state, we will not refinance credit card debt that was used for personal reasons. So it has to be all strategic and and proved with the evidence, the actual invoice of what those credit uh, card expenses right. were, were spent. So so consolidations, debt consolidations, refinances get a little bit tricky in the fact that a lot of times the borrower doesn't want to provide that information. We really can't help them. However, the spirit is, like Debbie said, if we can refinance the debt, give them longer terms, lesser interest rates, it makes the operation healthy, um, you know, and and, and helps the borrower to succeed um, when we get into large operations manufacturing um, or business big businesses a lot of times people will want to refinance existing bank debt so you move from one bank to the other that's still considered a refinance and we still have to verify that those original use of proceeds was an eligible purpose so again the borrower has to uh, illustrate that it was for business purposes, not for non-eligible or personal purposes. So, um, but the spirit for all of us is that you shouldn't be doing refinances or debt consolidations because you're charging a fee. You shouldn't be doing it just to trade dollars. It should benefit the borrower. Yes. Okay, we have just a few minutes left. Um, um, more questions in the chat than we would have time for. Um, the rest of the day, I think, but uh -huh. I want to offer <laughs> to both of you uh, the opportunity to, if there's anything that we missed that you wanted to point out um, in just a few minutes each, do you have any like final thoughts on um, uh, anything that we may have missed? Go ahead, Deb. I, are you going to let me go with it? Okay, well, De <laughs> Debbie can jump in anytime. I tend to ramble, sorry. Um, probably the thing that we really didn't talk about, we touched on is the state loan guarantee program, which is an option to all available commercial lenders, CDFIs, credit unions in the state of California. And this is our biggest tool for Debbie and ourselves and the other FDCs in the state because we can... Um, utilize the funds provided by the commercial lenders and uh, we have a trust fund that can guarantee those funds we're able to mitigate their risk to a maximum loss of 20 percent now they can get a 50 percent guarantee but we can loan up to 80 percent um, and i don't know if cameron wants to put up that slide about the state loan guarantee program but we can go up to five million dollars and that's $5 million as far as liability. Uh, we can make a loan or guarantee a loan up to 10 million and they get a 50% guarantee. Um, the, it's like a chameleon. Uh, this uh, loan guarantee can change its spots. It can, we can guarantee agricultural loans, manufacturing loans, construction loans, working capital loans, lines of credit. We can even guarantee nonprofits. And I think that's the best kept secret of the program and what we really need to talk about with the commercial lenders, because Debbie and I, we're nonprofits. We know how hard it is to go get a line of credit. Even though we're very uh, much a financially stable organization, uh, most banks don't want to lend to nonprofits. So again, that loan guarantee can uh, be utilized to mitigate the risk to the bank. And um, what we need to do is get the commercial lenders more knowledgeable about our program. Um, having worked with SBA, uh, we were a CDC and we did 504 loans. We've done micro loans. I've worked with USDA, FSA. I have wonderful relationships with our government agencies. But you talk to a commercial lender about a loan guarantee and they think, oh, 
That's so much work. Oh my gosh, we don't have time for that. It's going to take forever. Well, the news is that that's totally wrong. Uh, Debbie and I, both of our organizations, our approval time is one week to two weeks. Uh, once we get a completed package from a bank, it's a no doc program. The, uh, the commercial lenders don't have to use any special forms other than we do have some forms at closing that they have to sign, but they're a template and it's not hard. And um, but there's a lot of flexibility. We're a lot less structured than all of the government agencies that I just mentioned. It's a very flexible program. We can split guarantees. We can do participation loans with guarantees. Um, it's just a tremendous tool that everyone needs to know more about. And so probably the thing that would be the takeaway from this webinar is to get our contact information, both Debbie's and mine. And if there's any questions, you call us personally, because if we can't do the deal, we know somebody that can. And um, they just haven't heard or thought of the loan guarantee program. It is the best product that the state can offer to help small businesses either start, grow, or, or expand. Debbie, you want to add to that? I, I think you've said it all. I think for, for us as FDCs as well is to quash that, that impression that using the state loan guarantee program is so difficult. Um, and we encourage lenders, for those of you who are lenders on this, this webinar, to look, look into becoming a participating lender for the state loan guarantee program in California, because it is very easy, very streamlined. Um, it's, it's a function of calling our loan officers and saying, hey, I have a deal that looks like this, walks like this, talks like this, what do you think? And they'll tell you to send over the package. For us, we can, from the time we, we get the complete package to the time it's docked, it's the maximum is about two weeks. And you're not going to find that. I don't want to disparage the 7A program, but the the level of bureaucracy is not as is not there. Um, you have a person to talk to at the FDCs. And I, I think there's a couple of other SBCs on this call, but you know, my my message to lenders and to borrowers is if you're a borrower and your bank is telling you you're not qualified for this reason, ask them about the state loan guarantee program. And if you're a lender and you ha have a loan that isn't gonna qualify maybe for SBA or another loan, look into the state loan guarantee program. Um, our, our feedback from lenders is that, Oh, I wish we had started using you all for a long time ago. It is so it is so easy. I can call Lydia or Terry and you know know right away whether or not the loan guarantee program is the right product and then they'll they'll send it well you know they'll send us over the package. So um and I think the other thing too is that most banks are have SBA departments. So there's that reluctance to, to move outside the box. And Deb, tell me if I'm wrong, but for the most part with the state loan guarantee program, we're dealing more with regional banks and community banks and, and, and credit unions. There are very few, if any of our FDCs that um, guarantee loans with the very, very large banks. And it's a lot of it is because they have their own you know, loan centers. And if it doesn't check the box, it's not going to go. Did I say that right. right? Yep, that's exactly right. And and again, um, let's pat ourselves on the back, CDFIs. I think the CDFIs have done a tremendous job, especially since 2009, um, because the banks have changed. I mean, 15 years ago, you could get a $50,000 line of credit or you could do a startup loan with a guarantee. But right now, um, they would prefer that the CDFIs do them. And we we are. And we're doing a great job at it. We just need more capital to lend. <laughs> so <laughs> it's great. But, uh, I bet uh, also those same commercial banks have worked well with us in the past on the uh, state loan guarantee program. So we've kind of shifted, kind of changed roles. But 
the, the role of the CDFI is very, very important to the economy of the state of California. It is. Okay, well, thank you both of you. And um, uh, we have dropped your uh, contact information in the chat. Um, and uh, also anyone can feel free to reach out to me and I can make sure that we're connected to you or to other lenders um, that uh, uh, do the same type of thing in the state. But right now we're gonna jump over so we don't run out of time today. But thank you, Debbie and Deb. I owe you, you a lot for this. It was yeah. great. And um, I'll stay in touch with both of you. You know it. Thank you, um, thank you for inviting us. Thanks. So next up, we have Heather Luthi, who is the uh, district director for the Sacramento District Office for the U.S. Small Business Administration. And uh, she has over 30 years of banking and finance experience and has been with SBA for what? Eight years? Something? I'm, 14 anyway. years. 14 years. Oh, yeah. I took right. I took a three year hiatus, but then came back. So, well, I will turn it over to you. So thank you, Heather, for coming here and talking to us about SBA lending programs. Absolutely, Melinda. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to EDA for, for putting on the program. And thank you to Debbie and Deborah. Um, I think they just gave some really, really valuable information. And I hope the participants on the call um, really reach out and, and realize how broad a brush um, lending can be. There are so many different facets to it. And um, from the economic development standpoint, you can offer to your small businesses or talk to your small businesses about a menagerie of programs. I don't necessarily think that we would ask you to um, become experts in any of this, but just know that you've got the contact information for the folks that can assist. So in any case, um, as Melinda stated, Heather Lutze, U.S. Small Business Administration, I um, have the honor and pleasure of operating the Sacramento District Office. And there are six different offices within the state of California to service um, the needs. California is one um, of the uh, California state has six district offices. And we're basically one of two. Texas is the only other one um, that has six district offices. So SBA as a whole has 68 different district offices throughout the country. And um, our entire purpose is to support small businesses. We do that in a couple of different ways. Um, most notably, our loan programs. And with SBA loan programs, um, as Debbie kind of spoke about, the SBA microloan program, California Capital just entered into the arena of a micro lender. So we're thrilled to welcome Debbie and her team on board in that capacity, although we've worked with them for many, many years. In any case, I just wanted to kind of give a high level overview of the different products, uh, product offerings uh, from SBA with respect to loans. So micro loans, they can go from $500 up to $50,000. Then our 7A loan program, which is kind of our flagship program, it is, um, for lack of a better word, I think the umbrella that encompasses a lot of the subsets of that 7A program. That can go anywhere from 5,000 to 5 million and can be used for a variety of different reasons. And then we have a 504 loan program. The 504 loan program is really for, um, Heavy equipment, uh, commercial real estate, um, that type of thing. Something uh, very substantial projects. The 7A program does work with the 504 program. You can marry those two uh, depending on the circumstances, but they are separate and distinct programs. Uh, with the uh, eligibility of SBA, can you go to the next slide, please, Cameron? SBA requires just a few things, and one, you have to be a citizen uh, or have a green card status. Can't exceed SBA size standard limits, and those size standards are based on the NAICS codes of the business. So that's the North American Industry Classification System. 
And that basically uh, tells you whether you can look to a revenue cap for the size or to an employee size cap. Uh, a lot of manufacturing firms can go up to, you know, uh, 500, a thousand. It just depends on the circumstance. So the NAICS code of the small business is extremely important when you're looking at those size standards. But having said that, 99.9% .9 of the businesses in the country are truly considered small under our size standards. So don't let that kind of scare you off. Um, owners have to be of good character. So when we say good character, it's um, something that Deborah had mentioned earlier. It's basically we want to make sure that they um, have the capacity to repay the debt, that they, um, you know, haven't had, you know, a bunch of collections and judgments on their credit report. Have they walked away from other obligations in the past? You know, on occasion, if they have, it, it really behooves the lender or the applicant for that matter to write some type of an explanation. If it was an isolated incident, um, a death in the family, a sickness, something along those lines, and it happened in a brief period of time, explain it. We can take that and move on. We used to, uh, prior to the revision of our SOP, have um, a preclusion for um, those uh, incarcerated persons and those on parole, probation, et cetera. We have uh, lightened up the requirements surrounding that. They still cannot be incarcerated. However, um, we will take a look at, at um, individuals that uh, potentially have had uh, issues in the past with their character. The other thing is that we do look for um, management experience. So if you're, um, you know, uh, working at a coffee shop and you want to open um, a, a technology consulting company, how do we know that that will actually lead to success? So we're going to ask a lot of questions in those particular cases. And then, of course, as I stated, the ability to repay the loan and the ability to repay the loan has to be from the cash flow of the small business. So we're going to look to um, projected earnings, perhaps on uh, a startup company or historical cash flow if it's a company that's been around for a while. Um, the. Parameters regarding um, not being engaged in lending, real estate development, spec uh, investments, that type of thing, uh, that, that's a steadfast rule. It's actually part of the, the regulation and can't not, cannot be adjusted. So we don't want investors. You know, we don't lend on apartment buildings. We don't do any of those things. Um, and I think... I, I just said something. We don't lend. And let me let me clarify. SBA is not a direct lender. We actually offer a guarantee to banks, credit unions, um, intermediaries, uh, CDCs, etc. So it, it's basically a guarantee program. It's really up to the lending institution to approve the borrower before they submit it to SBA. Now, there's a couple different ways that uh, lenders can work with SBA. There is something that we call PLP or Preferred Lending Program. And what that means is that SBA has offered delegated authority to these particular lenders to make the decisions on SBA's behalf. And um, I, I'm just kind of going off script here, so bear with me, Cameron. Um, I'll tell you when to switch. In any case, I just kind of wanted to clarify that. And then we have our GP or general program and um, or guarantee program. And that's where the lending institution, if they either don't have that delegated authority or perhaps they have a concern about the loan, they're not positive how SBA is going to view that loan. They can certainly submit it to us um, and we would go ahead and provide that uh, that underwrite and guarantee for the loan without, um, you know, the the bar, uh, the lender being on the hook for the entire thing. So just kind of wanted to clarify that. Now you can move to the next page, Cameron. Thanks. 
So again, with the 7A program, it's kind of the umbrella, if you will, um, for all of the different subsets. So there are um, a lot of different facets of the 7A loan. I noticed that there was a question in the chat earlier with respect to um, contract lending, and SBA has a program for that. So we actually call it a contract cap line program. And so we have uh, cap line programs, we have express programs, and our express programs are very uh, simplistic packages. Uh, typically, um, uh, a term loan, uh, although it can be a revolver, it just depends on how the lender wants to structure that. With the SBA program um, and really any government guaranteed program, there are safeguards built in from uh, the perspective of the small business. And that's really where I think we shine. There are, um, I think, uh, the conversation between Deb and Debbie earlier uh, when Melinda was inter interviewing them, there was talk about online lenders and predatory lending. So the, unfortunately, we find ourselves in uh, a time and place where there are lenders operating out there that are not regulated. And when these lenders are not regulated, there are no uh, ceilings or caps in the amount of interest that can get charged. And I know Debbie gave an analogy. I think it was 34% that she had said. But I'm going to tell you, about four months ago, I came across um, a debt refinance that was submitted here to um, the, the office. And the actual interest rate was 144%. So I called talked to the, the small business and they said, oh, no, 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 it's 12%. It's 12%. We know that that's high, but it's 12. I said, no, it's not. You're not looking at what, what the lender had actually quoted them was 12%, but it was 12% per month, not as an annual percentage rate or APR. Those unregulated lenders are not obligated to quote APR. So therefore, there's a lot of... Um, Miss uh, information about that, and of course, you know the the online lenders, the predatory lenders want to make the sale, so they're not going to be uh, upfront and honest with with the consumer or the small business, and it's really unfortunate. Um, so, just I would caution um, you in the economic development field to please counsel your businesses. Fast is not always best. And I know that there are so many commercials that you see nowadays that, you know, we can get the money for you uh, in the bank by the morning, or, you know, we can fund your loan the same day, or we can underwrite it in hours. Well, you know what? It's not necessary. So if you have businesses that are trying to gain access to capital in that fashion, they're not only doing themselves a disservice, but their community a disservice. And the reason is, is it, these, these small businesses should really approach lending as a strategy and looking forward in their business. Am I going to need funding in six months? Am I going to need funding in a year? Am I going to need it in five years? The best time to ask for funding is when you don't need it. So there's no sense of urgency, no sense of, you know, I've got to get this done today or, and stress on the small businesses part. So I would just really, really advocate for um, taking their time, looking at the options that are available to them. Um, and again, with the safeguards, as we're showing on the screen here, there's a lot of different caps on the interest rates. I mean, two and a quarter um, for seven years or less, or 2.75 over seven years, that's a very palatable rate. Now, uh, I know somebody else had mentioned rates earlier, and, and we are in um, a higher interest rate environment. Although, we're back to kind of normal circumstances. We're back to like 15 years ago, which is great um, for the stability of our communities. It's great. It's just a little bit of a mind shift um, from the standpoint of interest rates. And of course, during the pandemic, uh, we saw a lot of money flowing, a lot of cheap money flowing. 
a uh, lot of, you know, home uh, interest rates at, you know, two and a half percent for 30 years. So, uh, you know, God bless those people that that were able to capitalize on that. But that's not coming back. Then we need to set the proper expectations with our small businesses and consumers. Um, next slide, please. So the next slide is basically just going over the 504 loan program. So the 504 loan program, again, operates a little bit differently than our 7A, which is kind of an all-encompassing program. 504 is specific to commercial uh, real estate and or heavy equipment. Um, with that said, we can go up to five and a half million and um, we partner with a certified development company or a CDC. And the way that it works is it's kind of um, consider it a partnership of three, if you will. The SBA um, will cover the loan for the CDC. We guarantee that at 100% for the CDC. The lending institution covers up to 50% of the, the cost of the, the loan or the, um, pardon me, the building, the construction. Um, or purchase, with that 50%, that uh, lender actually gets a first trust position. So they're in first position. So most lenders are extremely comfortable and supportive of this program. The CDC, again, is guaranteed by the SBA, so they're covered. And then the borrower applicant only has to come in with 10%. So 10% is very, very feasible. And I know Deborah kind of talked about her program with that as well. So um, really makes a lot of sense in the uh, commercial real estate and uh, commercial construction fields, um, heavy equipment, et cetera, to look at a 504 option. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about SBA with our resource partner network. And as I indicated, SBA is not a direct lender, but what we do do is offer support to our lending institutions. And that support is, of course, with the loan guarantee, but also is with respect to assisting in, um, you know, business development from the standpoint of um, the lender. So a lot of our SBDCs or small business development centers, our women's business centers, our veterans business outreach center, and our SCORE volunteers and mentors do handoffs very frequently to lending institutions. And they uh, can assist with packaging the loans, getting all of the documentation that's necessary. A lot of the um, uh, counselors within the Women's Business Center or Small Business Development Centers understand financials. So they're able to sit down with the applicant and kind of go through and spread um, the, the finances, help in creating the projections, et cetera. So really uh, an added benefit. So if you're not connected with any of our resource partners, I would really encourage you to do so. They're funded in part um, through a cooperative agreement with SBA. And just to give you an example with, um, you know, the small business development centers, we partner with the state of California to support them. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the contacts here are for my office. We do have uh, a newsletter that goes out. And within that newsletter, we promote different activities and trainings and um, networking events that our resource partners and frankly, a lot of our community partners are doing as well. So um, you can sign up for our newsletter. The, uh, the Sacramento underscore DO at SBA.gov is our email address. The newsletter is, um, I'll, I'll show you on the next slide, but before we get there, I just want to kind of put a highlight real quick on this small business summer school. So we're just kind of calling this our summer school because we just launched a fantastic program um, for our small businesses. So within the um Within that site, that the learning platform, there are a bunch of different courses that each 
participant can take. They can um, go on there, learn how to create a business plan, learn how to launch their business, learn how to manage their business, um, marketing strategies to win customers. Um, there's information on mentor protege programs, um, you know, how to find new funding customers and new locations. And then each of these um, categories has a subset of different trainings located within them. So just for example, under the marketing program, there are um, marketing 101 tutorials, uh, competitive advantage tutorials, social media marketing, kind of a how to on all of those. So I would encourage you to check those out as well. And, um, and please pass the word on to the small businesses uh, that you're working with. The next page, if you would please, Cameron, Right here, this QR code, this is how to stay in touch with us. And by utilizing the QR code, you can actually sign up for our uh, district office newsletter right through that. And uh, again, we would encourage you to do so. If you're doing any events within your um, territories, we encourage you to reach out to your local SBA district office and give them the information so that we can help you in marketing that. Um, next page, please. And then uh, this is basically, how are we doing? We would love your feedback. If you um, wouldn't mind giving us some feedback on the products and services and um, customer service that you've received um, or unfortunately haven't received from SBA, we wanna hear it, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We can't better ourselves if we don't know about any issues. So please take a moment and, and um, provide some feedback. Thank you so much again for the opportunity, Melinda, and um, I'm happy to stay on and answer questions. Well, thank you. Um, I don't think we have any time for questions right now, but we will certainly let you uh, know if we do. Uh, we'll Perfect. send those to you. Um, Heather is a great resource. Uh, I've worked with her now for years, and uh, she is a great partner. So uh, you, next Melinda. up, um, and hopefully everybody can stick with us for a little bit longer than our 2.30 uh, ending time because we're running over. But next is another great partner, and that's Dan Johnson from USDA Rural Development. Let you have it, Dan. Thanks. Thank you, Melinda and EDA, for inviting me today. Um, again, I'm, I'm Dan Johnson with USDA Rural Development, where we are committed to helping improve the economy and quality of life in rural America. That's that's our mission. We offer loans, grants, and uh, similar to SBA loan guarantees to help create jobs and support um, economic development. Cameron, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and go through these slides really really quick. So we'll just uh, just go to the next. Um, today, uh, I'm gonna just focus on two of our revolving loan fund programs that help support our mission area. You've heard this mentioned a little bit earlier today, but first let's talk about the intermediary relending program. Um, we just refer to it as the IRP. So under this program, um, we provide 1% uh, interest rate loans to uh, local lenders who we call intermediaries, and then they relend those funds to rural businesses that are known as uh, ultimate recipients. And you'll hear me kind of flip back and forth between talking about inter intermediaries and um, ultimate recipients. But uh, anyway, it's a 1% loan program to the intermediary. Uh, next slide. And there are four groups that are eligible for this program. We deal often with nonprofits and public agencies, but um, federally recognized tribes and cooperatives are available or eligible for this program as well. Next. Entities that apply for uh, these IRP funds can apply for up to a million dollars each year, um, not to exceed 15 million total. It's a it's a competitive process, um, a quarterly competition. I'll mention a little bit more later. And that's not to say, though, that we couldn't do a smaller loan. We we often uh, an organization will want to start, you know, with the establishment of an, uh, of an IRP uh, fund at 300,000 or 500,000. So it doesn't have to be a million. It's just that uh, the million is, is the max. Next. So the terms for the lender, I mentioned that it's 1%, um, 30 year payback, interest only for the three years based on, on the principal, uh, principal that they've drawn down. 
And um, we do have some requirements that, uh, for example, for a million dollar loan that you at least get 25% out there um, in in the, the, the first six months. Um, we do also require that the intermediary establish a loss reserve fund equal to um, 6% of the outstanding ultimate recipient portfolio over, over a three year period. Next. So talking about the ultimate recipient businesses, the businesses that, that, that our IRP lenders make these loans to, um, it can be individuals, private, you know, it can even be a public organization. They just have to have the majority uh, ownership by U.S. citizens or permanent residents. Um, the applicant can't have any federal uh, delinquent federal debt. Um, they do have to be unable to obtain commercial financing elsewhere, and, and we just require that the intermediary document that for the file. We don't ask that the ultimate go out and obtain, uh, you know, letters of denial from from other other lenders. We we know that that's a that's a, a, a an extra step. It also has to be in an eligible rural area, and I have a slide that'll talk about that again. And of course, the um, the ultimate recipient business can't have any any financial interest um, within that that intermediary. Next. So the the terms um, for the ultimate recipient business are actually set by the the intermediary, so that they need to cover the costs of their you know operating and administrative uh, costs for operating the the RLF. Um, and we had a really neat regulation change um, in December of 2021, where um, IRP loans that we we make after that date, um, ultimate recipient loans can can go up to 400,000 or 50% of, of, of what the IRP loan was to the lender. And, and in case that's confusing, um, say, for example, you, you, you know, a lender wanted to start out with a $500,000 uh, IRP loan, um, they would just be limited to a 250,000 max. So at least make two, two loans with the, the IRP fund. Um, also, there is a requirement that, um, that the uh, ultimate recipient business uh, bring in at least 25% of, of the costs of their project with non-federal funds. It can be their own funds, cash funds, or, or funds from another lender, but uh, the federal participation is, is limited to 75%. Next slide. All kinds of, 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 of ways that these funds can be used that ultimate recipients um, you know, establishing a new business. It can be you know, to acquire uh, you know, a building. Um, often for machinery and equipment. Um, I think I mentioned working capital. Um, these loans are subject to um, federal environmental standards we refer to as NEPA. Um, and so we do see that a lot of our intermediaries uh, pretty much use these funds for working capital and equipment kinds of loans or, 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 or the purchase of a building. Anytime you get involved with construction where there's going to be ground disturbance, it often kicks that, that environmental review into a little higher category that, uh, that could be more costly, but, um, but it can be done with IRP funds. And then uh, one more slide on the IRP program. Cameron, this, this just uh, talks about the um, eligible area, and essentially it's 50000 So. Um, these ultimate recipient businesses that obtain these these funds from the IRP lender um, have to live in a, in a community of 50,000 or less. We have a really good website that those addresses can be checked on. The intermediary themselves do not have to be located in a in a rural area. They can be in an urban area, a larger area. Um, uh, uh, they they do. We do ask at the time of application for them to. Um, to define the area that they intend to serve, the geographic area, and from a scoring standpoint, these uh, it, it is helpful to uh, you know to to lend money in 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 more rural communities, communities with smaller populations, um, lower median household incomes, and so forth. So um, that's the quick and dirty on the IRP program. Um, next slide. Let's talk for just a minute about our Rural Micro Entrepreneurial Assistance Program. Uh, that's a mouthful, and so um, we just generally re refer to that as uh, RMAP. And it's very similar to IRP in so many ways, um, but there are some, some distinct differences. Um, and I'll try and point those out as we, as we go through these slides. So essentially, this program is providing loans and grants to uh, instead of referring to them as intermediaries, we're talking about micro development organizations, and it's generally for either startup or or, or business expansion through a micro loan revolving loan fund. And there's also a technical assistance grant component with this as well. Next slide. So who can apply for these funds? Nonprofits are probably our most uh, 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 the group that we deal with most office. 
uh, often tribes as well as institutions of higher education. Note, unlike um, the IRP, we're not allowed to, uh, to actually lend to public entities. And then on the, on the ultimate recipient side, the businesses again have to be located in an eligible rural area. And our definition of a, of a micro enterprise is, is one that has 10 or fewer um, full-time employees. Next slide. An eligible area is just like IRP uh, community, 50,000 or less. And again, the, uh, the, the MDO, the microdevelopment organization can be located uh, anywhere. Next slide. A few um, additional requirements of the, uh, of the MDO, the microdevelopment organization. Um, they must demonstrate that they've had um, either experience operating a revolving fund or certified that they've had the, you know, the education and training and, and, uh, and uh, 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 with with respect to micro enterprise development, and the point of this slide is really to say that 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 there is a path for an MDO that that doesn't have that demonstrated experience to actually apply for and receive funds to set up a revolving loan fund under under the RMAP program. So so the demonstrated experience isn't necessarily a requirement for um, RMAP. Uh, next next slide. Um, two kinds of funding, and I'm going to start with the second paragraph first. So loans, um, loans to the lender are are, are between fifty thousand and five hundred thousand, um, up to a maximum of of two point five million. Um, the, the the grants that come along with this are a little bit confusing, um, but it, it's really a cool provision of this. Unlike unlike the IRP program. Um, uh, our lenders can get up to 25% for the first 400,000 that they borrow, and then it drops to 5% after that. So that's a little confusing. So if a, uh, an applicant wanted to apply for a, a $500,000 loan, that would equate to a $105,000 grant. And so we see a lot of applications at that at that level. Um, we also have lenders that come in that just keep it keep it simple, and they apply for a $400,000 revolving loan fund. Um, loan and then you know that equates to a, a four hundred thousand dollar grant and these grants are subject to renewal based on the outstanding ultimate recipient portfolio each year as long as Congress continues to fund it so that's kind of a cool thing too next slide the terms for the the RMAP loan to the lender are twenty years with a complete deferral for two unlike IRP that uh, does require interest only payments. Um, so uh, essentially, at the end of the, the first two-year deferral, um, we look at an 18-year amortization to the, the lender, to the MDO. Next slide. And then terms to the ultimate recipient business would be loans up to $50,000, fixed rate, and again, like IRP, limited to 75% of the total project cost. They do need to come in with 25% non-federal funding. Next slide. Um, Funds can be used for working capital, refinancing, purchasing equipment, um, real estate improvements, just no construction. Again, we've got some environmental issues with, with that, so not any kind of construction activity. Um, the one big difference that I will point out is that you can, a lender can finance ag production, so we can do ag operating loans with, with RMAP. With IRP, you can do equipment. There are things you can do with IRP, but but you can't do production loans with IRP that like, like you can with RMAP. So, that's kind of a cool thing too. And then one last slide. Thank you. Um, a final note, I just wanted to mention that applications for these two programs um, from lenders, from IRP intermediaries or RMAP, um, micro development organizations are, are, are accepted on a quarterly basis. We follow the government cycle. So the next application deadline would be September 30th. Um, awards are usually made uh, 90 days after that. So just, just at the start of the next cycle. So you know, an application that came in uh, between now and September 30th would likely be funded by December 31st. IRP funds are more competitive. RMAP funds are, are sometimes undersubscribed. So we are uh, encouraging more uh, entities to consider applying for uh, M, uh, RMAP funds as well. So anyway, I apologize for running through that. This My contact information is on this slide and you are welcome to reach out. And uh, Melinda, you're welcome to share this, this slide deck with anybody or, 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 or post it as well. And so thank you Dan, again for including me today. Yeah, your email address wasn't on that slide. Can you give it to us quickly? Oh, yeah, it is. It's just my name. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Daniel.Johnson, just my name, D-A-N-I-E-L dot J-O-H-N-S-O-N at USDA dot G-O-V. Yeah, and we'll provide uh, contact information to others too. Perfect. So, Perfect. 
So thanks, Dan. Uh, it's always fun working with you. It um, is. You have been a great partner, Melinda. <laughs> um, so uh, I just want to introduce, I think, uh, Cameron, we're only going to do like the first three slides here of this, uh, and then we'll share them with uh, everyone. I'll put my camera on. Uh, so go to the next slide, please. So very briefly at EDA, we really want to help uh, grow your economy and help businesses start and grow. Um, again, I will send this out so everyone can look at it, uh, but let's go jump to the next slide. So um, the EDA RLF program is uh, funded under uh, our Economic Adjustment Assistance Program. Uh, and a little bit different than the IRPs and the uh, RMAPs that Dan was just talking about. These are grants uh, that require match um, and uh, you do not have to pay it back unless you mess up, uh, but that's very, very rare. Um, and uh, we require when you do an application, you tell us what area you're serving. And uh, with all of our applications, it ha has to be some economic distress. Uh, you also have to tell us when you apply, like how you're going to be um, operating this plan, uh, or operating this fund. Um, and I know I'm going really fast, so it's going to be incomplete. But uh, if anybody wants to apply for an RLF, uh, they can certainly reach out to me or any of my colleagues. I'll have our contact information in just a second. Um, uh, lost my track, train of thought. Uh, the, the RLF program used to be permanent. We, uh, uh, but Congress uh, just a few years ago gave us the ability to defederalize them. It never completely loses uh, the federal uh, linkage, uh, but uh, after about 10 years, there's some requirements in there. Um, it means you could stop reporting to us. Um, and uh, again, for the uh, for time, let's go ahead to the last slide. You can just scroll through these, Cameron. So a lot of the same things that you've seen with others. Uh, this is our regular EDA programs. So this is it. Uh, if any uh, organizations out there, communities think about uh, wanting to apply for an RLF, uh, here's the contact information for us in California. Asia is currently on maternity leave, so you can just reach out to me uh, for her counties. Uh, and we'll be glad to talk to you about that. Uh, but uh, we're also going to provide a list of all the RLF uh, providers in the state so that you can find the one closest to you. We will also be uh, providing um, a list of all the IRP uh, loan providers and RMAP loan providers and other things. Expect a number of emails from us with all kinds of great information. And uh, we are 10 minutes over, and I apologize for that, but I do want to thank everybody for joining us today, and we will get to your questions. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to me, mmatson1 at eda.gov. Um, I think you've seen a few emails from me lately, and I think that's it. If you haven't signed in, and I know Cameron's been reminding people, if you haven't signed in, please go ahead and do so. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. And we have two more webinars next week if you haven't signed up for those. Um, I believe we provided the access to those or Cameron can drop that in the chat. Um, but there's gonna be one on business assistance programs here in California. And then the other one is on uh, business assistance to ag producers. So thanks everyone. And I think we'll call that an end. Everyone have a good rest of your day.